sale lamb is sure to follow, which I used to do. Good afternoon, everyone, to the special, special class, especially today. We have some of the uh, most uh, successful, uh, knowledgeable uh, 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 people in the uh, fashion business who are here to help you, called Fashion Service Network. And they're very important to us because each one brings a, a, a big amount of uh, knowledge and connections for you to get jobs in the future. Because I thought this would be an important class for all of you. Uh, the opening subject of Fashion Service Network will give many avenues to all of you to network. Our panel will give students practical advice, strategies for employment entering the fashion industry because it's not an easy industry you're entering into today, in today's world. And uh, the uh, panel will also address students and recent graduates uh, who are considering a new FIT entrepreneurial program, uh, uh, startup challenges, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to waste time talking too much because they're four brilliant men here waiting to pass on knowledge that's very important to you. Uh, Michael Stanley of Rosenthal and Rosenthal is the panel moderator. He will take the podium once I get away from here. No, 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 I want you to do it. No, please, because you know the uh, background of all the men and you will do a, uh, justice to their presence here and Andrew Jassen of Jassen Consulting Group, and Tom Nastos, uh, ENK International Trade Events, and uh, Steve DeFontes, Big Idea Advertising, and Stuart Cagle uh, is here, 24? Okay, and that, that's enough out of me, I want to take give the panel over to our moderator, our wonderful Michael Stanley. Please rescue me, Michael. Thank you. Can you, I have to move it up. Thank you, for, Alice, thank you very much for that lovely in, introduction, of sort of, and thank, thank, I don't think you had a choice, but thank you for coming anyhow. Um, Alice did a, you did a very nice job in introducing our esteemed panel here. And, you know, my usual question would be, tell us who you are, what you do, and who you do it for. And I'm going to start out with Steve DeFontes. Okay. Uh, my name is Stephen DeFontes. I own Big Idea Advertising. Uh, it's an advertising and marketing firm in Union Square. Uh, we produce communications for all types of companies, really. Uh, from branding and logo development all the way through print ads, brochures, website development, e-commerce site development. So a pretty wide range of media communications. Uh, some of our clients include uh, brands that you might know like uh, The Art of Shaving or Hale and Hardy Soups here in Manhattan. And, what do you, and so you helped them with advertising. Steve, tell us a little yeah. bit more. Sure. What do you do for them? Uh, well, we're primarily a consultancy on the creative development side, so we'll come in and help them determine what a marketing strategy should be, uh, how can they reach the consumers that they're looking to reach, and how can they influence those people to buy their products. How did you, I'm just curious, because I'm, you know, we know each other and all, but how did you get that job? How did you have found the company? Tell us about your sure. career. Sure, uh, I started the company at 26. Um, I had worked at a boutique ad agency for about four years uh, before I left and went out on my own. And uh, it kind of happened very naturally for me. I really started <coughs> freelancing, basically just going directly to clients with my portfolio. And uh, sort of very quickly traded up from rather small retail clients to larger brands. And uh, that just kind of naturally grew into hiring employees, finding an office space, and uh, really developed into the company that we have today. Good. Great. Terrific. Stuart, you're on. Hi, I'm Stuart Cagle. The name of my company is 24-7. We're a uh, 
global talent resource for international brands. We provide the creative talent that influences product from all the way from concept to commercialization. Uh, in the, uh, I have to cheat and read these to you. In the, uh, in the fashion space, uh, some of our clients are Haynes, L'Oreal, Victoria's Secret, David Yerman, Jones, Chico's down in Florida, Gap, Banana, Old Navy, uh, Polo, uh, I can't read my own writing, Tori Birch, uh, Donna Karen, Kenneth Cole, Mark Jacobs. Uh, we do business with about 565 fashion clients. Terrific. Tom Nastos. Hi, my name is uh, Tom Nastos. Uh, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Um, primarily, I do three different things. Uh, first, uh, I founded a company in uh, 1990, um, Endurance LLC. It was initially a private label manufacturing company, um, but it morphed into a uh, private label slash branding uh, licensing company as it uh, progressed over the years. Um, we've been involved in manufactured and distributed brands such as uh, uh, Rockaware in, in the hip-hop world or uh, Echo in, in the young men's, uh, Prokeds uh, in the sneaker business, uh, Joseph Aboud in the traditional men's, uh, Paper Denim and Cloth was one of our brands in the premium denim, and we just launched another premium denim brand by the name of Resin. Uh, so that's one, one part of the careers. I started that in 1990. Um, the other company that I run is uh, ENK uh, Trade Show Events, ENK International. Uh, ENK is a company um, that I served on the board of directors for a number of years. It's the largest uh, trade show company uh, in the United States for fashion trade shows, high-end fashion trade shows. Uh, we operate over 29 trade shows uh, in the United States, the largest one uh, being here in New York. If you see at the Javits Center, it's the pier called the Coterie. Um, you know, we have trade shows in men's, women's, uh, children's, um, accessories, uh, footwear, um, so just about every category in the fashion business. And then the third thing I do is I teach uh, at the graduate school here at FIT, supply chain management. Uh, and I'm looking for a job on Sundays. <laughs> so. Andy, can you beat yeah. Andy? You can't beat, he works much harder than all of you guys, but again, let's face it. Stuart's going to get me the job. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for being here. And thank FIT for allowing us to talk, and Professor Papazian. My background's a little bit different. I started in the apparel industry as a salesman a long, long time ago after going to graduate school, thinking that the apparel industry would be a very easy thing to make my chops with. And shortly thereafter, I learned that selling is just a function of working with design, production, distribution. And I quickly learned I'd better learn a lot about the business, and that's what I've done for the last, I guess, 40 years in the apparel industry. I was the president of Jones Apparel Group and the president of a company called Biederman Industries. Biederman was the holder of licenses for Paul Smith, Ralph Lauren Women's Wear, part of Giorgio Armani. We were partners with Yves Saint Laurent, and we owned Karl Lagerfeld's business. Um, my business is connecting the dots. Uh, my colleagues and I work with large and small design groups in apparel, footwear, jewelry, and other fashion products to include home furnishings and food. Uh, our job is primarily to look at ideas, to look at where they might work in the retail world or in the wholesale world, and try to make sense out of design, corporate finance, and logistics. And the one thread that you'll hear this afternoon and to this evening is connecting the dots, connectivity, is about communication. Uh, primary part of doing anything in fashion is to get your idea into someone else's backyard, their pocket, or in their wardrobe. My firm helps manage the ideas, connecting the dots. Along the way, we've done a lot of licensing work. We represent several of the large branding companies around the world which have wonderful products. And again, brands only work if they have products. We represent Paul Smith. 
We do all of Calvin Klein's licensing. We represent Joseph Abood. We represent Rag and Bone. We work with companies that are a little bit more contemporary, like Catherine Malandrino, Jill Stewart, and Annette Lepore. But it's all about product and connecting the dots. Good. So, you know, as I think Hannah's pointed out, we're all members of this group called Fashion Services Network. We have one of our other members here, Andrew Rotunda. Andrew runs a logistics company called uh, Dynamic Worldwide. Is that, I called it international before. And Andrew provides all the logistics, you know, the movement of the product back and forth for a lot of uh, importers and vendors, and also for a couple of very large retailers, Macy's being one. And the other thing that, that I'm very proud of Andrew for is that he has these trucks. They're, they're green trucks. They're electric trucks. And it's, it's really great, right? I want to borrow one because I have to move one of the kids over the weekend, but they're terrific. Um, I run a company called Rosendahl and Rosendahl. And Ro what Rosendahl does is we provide the financing for largely, most, the, our client's base is, is largely apparel and textiles and some jewelry and footwear. And we provide the financing for them. And our clients include a Steve Madden, a Diane von Furstenberg, a Seven Jeans, uh, you know, and, and, and the like. So going back to our esteemed panel, um, give us, Steve, one of your top career mistakes. I mean, it doesn't sound like you've made that many so far because you, it sounds like you're doing, you're doing amazing. Oh, but if you had to make a mistake, what, what, what was your biggest mistake? Um, you really have to be careful who you work with uh, when you're running your own company. Oh, sorry. And uh, there's certain vendors that I've worked with over the years that I think I wish I had uh, considered a little bit more how important they were going to be to the future of my business. I think I was uh, running it sort of, uh, like I said, it grew very naturally, but to know that you're working with lawyers or accountants who are uh, good at what they do and setting you up for a future w in which you're safe and secure is very important. And I think it, in the beginning, you sort of work with whoever you can afford to work with, and uh, those kinds of uh, those kinds of vendors and relationships are really important to running a business, and especially a creative business, uh, you tend to worry about the work a lot. You worry about the quality of the creative product that you're putting out, uh, and you don't necessarily focus on the financial aspects of the business, the legal aspects of the business, and those are equally or more important than the quality of the work that you're putting out. So mm -hmm. I, I definitely wish I had uh, considered those areas a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Andy, did you ever make a mistake in life, Andy? A couple. I think everyone in the fashion business has made a mistake or two. I think the most important mistakes that I've made is not paying attention to competition, thinking that what I was building and whatever mousetraps we had would be able to sustain themselves not looking over my shoulder what competition does. And one of the cardinal lessons in talking about building your product or building your brand is that unless you have competition and know what they do, you'll never succeed, or you'll succeed for a period of time and quickly be taken over or overtaken. So uh, if, if a mistake was made, it's called hubris, that false pride thinking what you do is better and will consistently keep going. Mm -hmm. Stuart. Uh, I think the biggest mistake uh, I made when uh, when we started 24-7 was not taking advantage of the information that was available. Uh, in other words, having opinions about subjects. Uh, when it took us about six months uh, to realize that in Steve's world, there, uh, we, were in, we were introduced to something called a focus group. We had never really asked questions of uh, respective groups like candidates, graduates like yourselves, hiring managers, the pe people who actually put people to work, the human resources department. Uh, and we started, uh, we started conducting focus groups when we were about six months old, asking questions of the group rather than walking around with an opinion. And I had lots of opinions, 
most of which were proved completely wrong uh, because we weren't asking the questions. Once we started asking the questions, uh, we started getting real information which was actionable. And when it started, I'll give you a brief example. When we first uh, conducted candidate interviews, I was convinced that the candidate universe wanted a 401k program and health insurance. And the very first candidate focus group that we had, we found out that what the candidates really wanted to do was be trained on technology they couldn't get access to. That was the most important thing in their world. How do I get training on technologies that are emerging that unless I work for the company that uses them, I can't be, I, I can't have access to it. And simultaneously, the hiring managers wanted trained people. So what it taught us was if we started training candidates on technology that the hiring managers wanted the candidates to have, the candidates, candidates could hit the ground running and they could get what they wanted. Well, that's a long way from a 401k and a health care plan. And we started training when we were six months old as a company. And we probably would have stumbled into that eventually. But asking the question was, was a very formidable change in the way we gathered information and reacted in the marketplace. And we do that today virtually every month. Tom. I'll just keep it brief. But, um, you know, we. The organizations and ourselves, we, we make mistakes, I don't want to say on a daily basis, but we do. We, we make mistakes continuously, and I think it's important for us to recognize whether they're individual mistakes or corporate mistakes. But I think that for us, the biggest lost opportunity that I see, whether it was a mistake or lost opportunity, uh, was that we were uh, in a position, I would say, 20 years ago or even maybe 25 years ago, at the right time, at the right place in Asia. And even though we did well, we didn't maximize, we didn't have the foresight to see exactly <clears throat> where certain things are going to go. Uh, I mean, it's easy to look back on, uh, but at the time we had to make certain decisions, and the decisions that we made were very U.S. branded centric, you know, on, on what was going around me that I was familiar with, as opposed to where the potential was, you know, growth was mm. going. So that, I, I would see that when I look back as a mistake. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna ask myself, that same question, and the answer is, Alice, as you know, I've never made a mistake so far. <laughs> but my, but my, this is a true story. Well, I don't want to go that far, but my founder made a mistake, and this is a true story. Imre Rosenthal, many, many years ago, some, a, a, a guy from the Bronx came in to see him, and he was, he, he was working at Brooks Brothers, but he developed his own line of ties. And, and, and Imre said, you know, he looked at he looked at the business plan and whatever else. And, he's, and his last name was a little strange. His last name was Lipschitz, right? And he thought about it. And he says, listen, he says, I think your ties are okay, but the name has got to go. And he turned, he threw, he, he says, I'm not interested. And he, and he left. Thereafter, the guy, you know the story, he, he changed his name to Lauren. And, and, and he made, he, he, it was a huge opportunity. He lost, he, he, you know, he missed it. So, but I learned from that mistake, okay? Uh, Andy wants to say something. You know, one thing that's important, first of all, loosen up everybody. This is not formal. How many of you guys are seniors? And how many of you have jobs, number one? or have been on interviews? Not a lot. A lot. Um, couple of things, and Mike asked a good question. First of all, we all make mistakes, but remember, mistakes are not fatal. In fashion, we all make mistakes all the time. And the objective of a good education is to teach us to cure those mistakes and learn more as we go forward. And I think everything we see in business starts with the mistake that we fix and get better doing. And, you know, you just came through sort of basic training. And basic training is like a military term. And next step is sort of boot camp. And then comes reality. And you're going to make a lot of mistakes, but don't harp on them. Take the next steps and go forward all the time. Do you think you should beat yourself up over the mistakes, Andy? No way. I mean, again, if done intelligently, your career path and what you do for work um, 
Those mistakes are going to happen. Just go on from them. Take the next step forward. Don't fall into a rut. I know we're all people, and we all fall into ruts every now and then. And be your own psychologist or psychiatrist or person next to you can help you get out of that rut. To Anthony, to Andy's point, it's, I think it's okay to look at your mistakes. <clears throat> Just don't stare at them. I agree. Let's talk about getting a job. It, it's tough, right? Uh, Steve, how do these guys get a job? Tell them. Uh, I get to look at a lot of resumes from, in my case, it's usually graphic designers, not fashion designers, although I've had a lot of designers who are also, also fashion designers or have gone on to become fashion designers. Um, but don't get discouraged by the fact that everyone says what a tough time it is to get a job for starters. Uh, they told me the same thing when I graduated, and uh, it's always going to be tough for, some, for people coming out of school to get a job. So f you have to ignore that. Don't get bogged down in that thought process from the very beginning. Um, standing out from the crowd is really important. Um, you want to stand out in a good way, so you want your resume to look as good as it can look. You want your portfolio to look as good as it possibly can look. The expectations of employers are that students coming out of school will have portfolios that look just as good or better than designers who have two, three years experience. So you need to compete with the rest of the people who we would consider juniors that are out there. Um, and we have an expectation that you're going to be more technically savvy, uh, that you're going to be aware of what's out there already and your portfolio is going to look just as good. Uh, I, I also think that it's really important to not just look at uh, who's looking for help. Don't just answer one ads. Look for companies that you want to work for and try and see how you can approach that company and get a job there. How, on the resume, you know, everybody builds a resume and, you know, how honest should you really be with the resume, Andy? Andy, you, you, you're... How, don't lie. Don't lie 100%. First of all, you're all young, compared to us at least. Um, your resume is really a personal statement about who you are, and more importantly, it should be something directed at who you want to read that resume. No one expects you to have had a career working for Ralph Lauren or Bloomingdale's or Bergdorf Goodman, but the fact that you've been educated and you've grown up in a society looking at e-commerce, social media, that's part of your resume. It's a matter of incorporating that into a presentation to somebody. Yeah. But don't lie about something that you didn't do or couldn't have done because it's very easy to see through those lies. Especially it is. When you get to meet but somebody. Stuart, you read a lot of resume. How do you make your resume like stand out? How do you make it jump, jump so, so they're going to say, you know what, I have to see that person? Well, first of all, don't misspell anything. The first way to lose an audience is to have a typo or a spelling error. So that's the first rule, is to make sure that the resume is clean. Then look at who you're targeting your resume toward. Uh, it's okay to have different versions of your resume for different audiences. If you, it makes, just common sense. Uh, look at who the potential interview is. Recognizing network, network, network. But once you get to the point where you're writing your resume targeted at an interview or a specific company, uh, it's common sense. Get into the store, look at the merchandise, get on the internet, research what they're doing, find out if there's an acquisition or a trend within the company and at least have your resume targeted so that you can, when asked to explain your resume or talking about your business experiences, you can sort of target it toward, uh, toward the specific company with whom you're, you're interviewing. And go to 247talent.com and get a book. I said get, don't buy. It's free. 
the name of the book, How to Get a Job in Fashion. Download it and read it. 247talent.com, How to Get a Job in Fashion. And it's on your site, right? Pardon? It's on your website. It's on the website. Yeah. Just download it. It's right. free. It's free. Good. And it's helpful. Yeah. Tom, would, Tom, you interview a lot of people as well. Right. How quickly do you make, you've, send, you've seen the resume, so, you know, sure. and so now it's the interview process, right? So you meet this prospective employee. How long does it take you to decide whether or not to hire that individual? How long well, does it take? I, I can tell you the process that I go through, sure. you know, briefly. You know, tell us. Do that. Uh, number one, Stuart's absolutely correct. Do not have any spelling mistakes on your resume because we all look at that very carefully. It sounds small, but I generally toss the resumes. If, if you don't care for your resume, then I won't care for it. So that's number one. Uh, number two, from at least my perspective, be 100% honest and truthful on your resume because I check. I check references, and then depending on the job, I use security companies to check even further on you know, the, the truthfulness of exactly. So we follow up. If you do have a job and you were working from you know, 2004 to 2006 at a particular place, we will check on that, okay? Um, and then when I get to the actual interview itself, okay, generally um, what I do is I usually have some of associates in, in our company do interviews. So we may have the chief financial officer or the head of the department do the interview, and then you know, those notes are forwarded to me, and then I do the interview also. So, so for us, um, it might be a two or three individual process uh, you know, as far as interviews. And the reason I emphasize that is that at the end, and I think everybody here will agree, we're in a people business, and you know, all of our associates are critical to us to be successful, so I need to ensure that we make the right choice. Because if I make a bad choice, it sets me back a year. Okay, whether it's in product development or whether it's at the trade shows or so forth. So these decisions are actually critical to the organization at every level. Okay, and we want to ensure that we have people that are, you know, are, are aggressive, that, that you know, want to grow with the company, that have all the attributes that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Andy, you also meet a lot of people. Andy, tell us your thoughts. In, in the first 90 seconds of a meeting, first minute and a half, an impression is made. And that impression's about what you look like, how camped you are, your hands, your fingernails, how you address the meeting. Even though some of you are art students or design students, you're interviewing the company that's interviewing you at the same time. It takes a lot of time to undo the first 90 seconds of an error. So part of that is really you walking in with your best foot forward. Uh, the other thing that's important is it's very hard to find the right person to address a letter to. Uh, find out who the buyer is in a retail store or who the textile person would be in a, a design company. Write multiple letters to see if you can get into somebody. It's not that easy to get to the director of human resources and companies today. And again, this is such an early stage of your career, you just want to get your foot in the door to have that interview to make that best impression you can make. Interviewing the company that's willing to interview you. You know, I see everybody, you're paying, it, Alice, they're paying attention. This is amazing. So, I can't believe it. They must have had, would you give out red, would you give out red bull before they came in? So, if you have a question. You got it. Yes, this young lady right here. Yeah. What Jamie's question was is that, you know, what type of collateral would we use, you know, Rosenthal, to consider a young emerging designer to take on as a client? Well, we really, um, it's it's you probably not for it's unlikely that you would we would take on somebody who's just fresh out of a you know their first line, 
So, but if, if you had some level of, tra or if you were working with another company and you decided to get some capital and then, you know, split off, we would look at it. But the reality is one of our other colleagues, who's, I'll answer for him, um, Jeff Kaplman of, of Hilden, uh, he, 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 he will take on like a, what we call a startup. But typically, yes, you have to sign, when you go in to borrow money, yes, you have to pledge the assets of the company, and you also have, which is your primary collateral, but you also have to sign personally for what it's worth. Um, but the, the things we look at is how much money that you, the company is starting with the capital base. Well, you could look at a, yeah, you could try to find private investment. The reality is, is that, in my, my just, you know, little myopic suggestion, is that you, you're going to have, you may have a difficult time starting up on your own. You may want to work in conjunction with, you know, another, another company that's, that's already in operation. Say, listen, I, I have this terrific line, and I'd like to work as a division of yours with an understanding, after I hit a certain threshold, I can buy myself out, or you'll let me go, or some, some, you know, some exit strategy. And that works in many cases. Uh, and you see a, a, a huge amount of these, these deals. What, what would you suggest? My colleagues and I meet a lot of um, startup companies, some with great ideas, some with ideas which I don't even understand, and I've been around a long time. But the one thing that we find, and I have found all my career, is those of you that are the talented design or product people, who of, who of you are design people? Raise your hands. And how many of you are business people? I've studied business. And in the design group, how many of you can read a balance sheet? Okay, one step is learn how to read a balance sheet. It's a little painful, not that difficult. Every successful designer understands the cost of money and the cost of raw materials and the building of a cost sheet. Every successful de designer that I have met, and I'm assuming that my colleagues here have also met, who were really talented with great ideas and great personalities, to their right was a business person who took on the responsibility of the drudgery of buying product, of making sure logistics were in order, of dealing with Mike Stanley or the other lenders, or dealing with Stephen in advertising and taking those ideas and bringing them to fruition, or dealing with Tom who runs the greatest trade shows, or calling Stuart to hire more employees. Um, the team effort of taking great product and design sense married to understanding the business side is critical. And the names of the people that you would identify who've been successful when they had those people are Tommy Hilfiger with Joel Horowitz, and Ralph Lauren with Peter Strom, and Calvin Klein with Barry, and Norma Kamali with her then boyfriend, who's a financial guy, and down the line. The ones that have not been successful are legend. They've had four, five, six starts. And sometimes they survive. So the person sitting next to you, if it's a business person, try to engage them in talking about what to do. Um, it's very difficult without capital, that's both credit and capital, to be in business today. So ideas, concepts need to be married to something that will lubricate it into a business. I agree with you, but I don't want to discourage you because you could be the next Donna Karen. Let's face it. So don't get discouraged, you know, and we've always seen these startups. I mean, I'll tell you one that we got involved with uh, just a couple of years ago. She's doing them, is Rebecca Minkoff. And she had very little starting capital. She had this, and she's a young, I don't think she went here, but she, I don't recall what school she went to. But um, she's right now, she's at a run rate of about $15 million, you know, doing shoes, doing, um, uh, what else? A pack, she's done a pack, you know, she started making bags, and she was making bags on the, on the west side over here. And all of a sudden, you know, it, it took off, then she migrated to China, and now making apparel and shoes, and, and she's, she won the CFDA. She's like a rock star, this kid now. It's amazing. So, but don't get discouraged. It, it happens. In fact, I'll tell you very briefly my, my famous, uh, they know the story, with Steve Madden. When Steve Madden first started in business, he, had, he was making uh, shoes in Brooklyn, and they needed, um, they ran out of money, and his two partners were, got in the car, 
and they got a handful of invoices and they jumped in the car and they, would dri they drove into the city. They figured they would go in the city, give me the invoices and drive home with money. So when they came in, you know, Steve, oh, he brought the shoes. He put the shoes on my desk and he says, you know, these shoes, they're blowing out of Bloomingdale's. And all this. I said, that's good, that's good. And here's the invoices and we need money. I said, okay. I said, what about a financial statement, you know, a balance sheet? And Steve said, what's that? He didn't know what the hell I was talking about. It's true. I said, no, no, you have to have an account. So we set him up with an account and everything. And, and here's a story. Uh, Alice, it was Andy. He, it, I, not that I want to get in any trouble with him. I, I told you to shut the phone off. Okay? And, and it, he put, sit in the corner. So it, it happened. So, don't, so uh, don't get discouraged. There was another question I noticed over there. No? Oh, yes, there you are. No, no, because the likelihood is they're going to call up somebody, a friend of theirs who works at Sotheby's or Christie's, and they're going to be able to talk candidly, and they're going to say, hello, is, is this candidate any good? And they're going to say they were fabulous or they were no good. And that's what happened, right or wrong? Absolutely. Okay? Yeah, but, but that's the standard, you know, corporate answer that you got. But does, yeah, but HF, I'm just telling you pragmatically what happens, okay? Yeah, that's really what it is. Um, where was I? Yes. The, yeah, they're going to ask more questions. They're doing great, Alice. They're doing fabulous. Um, they're, they're doing fabulous. The question is, uh, my next question, um, how, when, when the first couple seconds at that interview, when you walk in, Stuart, Okay, number one, of course you wanna be on time. What, what other things do you need to do? What do you say the first couple seconds, Stuart? Well, the first thing you wanna do is be enthusiastic. Uh, it's a great opportunity, as Andy alluded, really, uh, in a candidate-rich environment, you're also interviewing the company. And part of that is conveying a confidence in your ability, your work, your ability to describe your work, and an enthusiasm about the business. I think it's, it's critical that, backing up here just, just, just a little bit, that uh, you keep in mind that uh, the most important thing in entering the fashion marketplace is to enter it, is to get some some background on your resume, some personal experience, so that you can start to build a story about your credentials. And I say that because a lot of hands raised about design, that design is your background. Don't dismiss product development. Don't dismiss sourcing. Uh, recognize that the first thing you need to get is a job. That's absolutely critical, critical. You don't have to take any job, but it's important to get into the marketplace with your skills. Once you have a job, you can migrate infinitely more easily than trying to migrate in a company from the outside looking in. So Stuart, what you're saying is that if, if you love Mark Jacobs, and you only wear, Mar and you're dying, you want to work for a Mark Jacobs, right? Or a, or a, you know, Neiman Marcus, call it. And you wouldn't even go into a Marshalls or a Ross store. Either you're going to work for Mark Jacobs or you're going to work for Neiman Marcus. How realistic is that, Andy? Is that, and this is your first job. Well. Other than Stephen, perhaps, we've all had a lot of jobs in our lives. And 
I don't think any of us sitting here or any of the members of our groups or our clients that have been successful are in the same job or the same job description they started with. So, one, you can desire an opportunity for Ralph Lauren or Calvin Klein or Neiman Marcus, and it's wonderful if you can get that, but as Stuart said, get into the job market, take a job, and build your resume, build your career, build your experience, invent yourselves. All of us here in fashion have reinvented ourselves over and over again. And hardly anyone that I know in any aspect of design or business administration or banking are in the position they're in without building that resume. They got a job, they got in the door, they figured out how to work the ropes, as they say, to launch themselves into a career. So first step is get in the door. It's not gonna be the first door of choice. You know, oftentimes design people, and whether it be jewelry or home furnishings or textile or, or apparel, can't get the job they want. They start in sales. Get in the door and learn the process. You know, nothing wrong with being a salesperson. It's a wonderful profession. But it allows you the access to retailers dealing with design, production, and issues like that. So yeah. get in the door. But, but Tom, let me ask you, how important is sort of, you know, we're a networking group and everything, but how important is networking for that first interview? Can, and can you use networking for that first interview? You, you could absolutely use networking for that first interview. Um, you, you know, as all these gentlemen mentioned, we are a community. Okay, so, so as a community, we, we all look to help each other, just like you, you know, our organization does. So I think networking is a key component, okay? And then the other part is I think what, what um, uh, Andy had just mentioned also, and, and Stuart had brought it up initially, um, when you get that opportunity, take advantage of it. You know, a couple of hints, you know, when you come in, you know, Andy said, be prepared. I think people that do research on the organization that you're interviewing with, you know, I always love people coming back with feedback uh, you know, not only what we do right, but, you know, I went to your show and it was, you know, the food was terrible, or, or I thought the lighting wasn't that good, or, you know what, the registration line was way too long. And, uh, you know, that's feedback that I actually look for. So, so I think that that type of, you know, discussion that, you know, during the interview is, is a positive. And then the simple thing, which probably your mom always reminds you, send a thank you note, a handwritten one. Okay, that goes a long way. Um, you know, people that generally don't do that, um, you know, Frankly, I kind of disregard, but, but if people send me a thank you note, say, listen, it was great meeting you and really appreciate it, and I look forward to the opportunity. And if you, you know, need anything else from me, I'm available, as Stu would say, 24-7. You know, then I put that on top of the list and say, mm -hmm, wow, mm -hmm, you know, that, mm -hmm. that's somebody that's uh, mm -hmm. you know, eager to have this position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Yeah. I, if, is there any, if you have a question, it's okay. There you go, this young lady right there. I'm going to defer, Steve, what are you, what are you doing with you? Uh, I'll answer that just br briefly on, on um, like yourself, I'm an, I, I'm an FIT alumni. And, and my first job was on 27th Street and Park Avenue, um, uh, warehousing. Uh, so I would unload the containers right here on 27th Street and Park Avenue. Believe it or not, there was warehouses, you know, when I was going to school here, um, you know, not that far from here. So. I got started. I got started in the industry, and you know, you know, 25 years, 30 years later, would I imagine that I'm doing what I'm doing today from working as a young guy in a, in, you know, in a warehouse picking and packing and unloading containers? Absolutely not. But I think you know, one of the things that these panels have said is that you get started in the industry, okay, and and you you take it step by step. So I don't think you get pigeonholed. 
I think talent gets recognized. And if you have the talent and the ambition and the desire, okay, this is an industry that I think you could rapidly grow. Okay, but I think in this economic circumstance with this group, okay, I think the challenge is getting started. You know, I went from that job to, there was a gentleman, and probably Andy would remember him by the name of Bernie Chouse, who, who had a young company at the time, and I, I sat in his lobby 11 straight days, okay, trying to get somebody to talk to me, to the point that he had to come out and say, do you really work here? Okay, I said, no, but I'm trying to get somebody, you know, I really want to work here. He hired me just for the point that I was there for 11 straight days and I wasn't going to accept the fact that, you know, because he was an up and coming company and I knew that, you know, that that was going to be a place for me to get out of the warehouse into some, something else. So I, I literally forced the issue. So I think that what you have to basically do is get yourself started. Don't be as concerned with being pigeonholed as opposed to let me get in, you know, begin that networking process. And then with that networking process, you will create your own opportunities. I think that happens. I, I agree. I think, Tom, you're right. If you're, if you're in an organization and, you, and it may not be the perfect job, other people will see you. And, and recently, we hired one of my other department heads, hired this really sharp young man at a graduate school, whatever. And, he, and, I, and I said, you know, he looks, really, he looks really with it. And I said, Joel, he's not, he's not going to work for you so long because, Joel, you're a jackass and he's going to wind up quitting. So I <laughs> took him. It's true. It's a, these are all these stories, Andrew. I'm telling you, these are true stories. You can write them down. And I took him, and I don't know if you've met him, this uh, Jeff Sesco. He is so sharp, so terrific, such a, an earnest, you know, hardworking guy. We're promoting him, we're moving him out to California just to help out with our, Cal you know, we have a very growing in California office. So don't worry about just, get your, get your foot in the door, because if, if you have talent and you really love it, somebody will see you and take you, you'll, you'll, you'll bounce around. It, it, it works. Plus, um, plus you're building a resume. And the only person who can pigeonhole you is you. The reality is your talent is, is going to be recognized. You just have to get into a place where it can be recognized. But be recognized. Carry a pad, take notes, carry an, an iPad. Carry something that makes people think that you're interested, that you are interested in doing. And use your, use your head. If, uh, if you're interviewing at, at Polo, you don't want to go in with the latest BB creation. You know, you want to you want to use your head, and uh, sure. you're, all, you're all accomplished, you're all intelligent, you're all engaged in the business. Steve, on an interview, if you're interviewing for, you know, what do you, what, you know the company you're interviewing, what do you, tell us how you, what to wear, how do you dress, and what, what do we do? Uh, you definitely have to know your audience, but, okay. uh, you know, fashion, you guys can, can be a little bit more liberal, but it never hurts to be more professionally dressed than the person that you're visiting. So uh, if you've got to err on a side, uh, always err on the side of, of being more formal and more presentable. Um, you want to be taken seriously, especially when you're young and you look young and people know that you're young. Um, they, you need a way for them to see you as taking their work as seriously as they want it to be taken. And, uh, and that's certainly one of the biggest ways to show them that you care. Yes, Andy. You all have some advantages over graduating students from five years ago. You've grown up with the internet, with social media. You've grown up with communications and connectivity, which is different. Uh, the retail world changes every Monday morning with new concepts, new techniques of how to talk to consumers, how to sell product. You're expert now because you live there. That's something that other people may not have. Use that as a tool in talking to people about the new retail, about the new communication, the new trending of how to be able to talk what you are, and that is communicators. Make people believe that you know what it is of how to bring information forward. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, you really get in, Abe, how do you get to be a member? You have to be in, invited in. More or less, right, Abe? It's like a. I don't know. How do you, Abe, Abe, Abe Beta, who's a wonderful human being, and, and you're terrific. How do you, Abe, answer the question, Abe? 
Well, it's an organization for, for professional people, and it's by invitation of the group. So after you're well established, we hope to see from you and know from you. And it's an organization of service providers, yeah. uh, people that help the companies that are, that are out there, uh, inf infuse them with good ideas and help them grow. And we'll hear from you then. Is that Ka Karen? I can't see Karen's that. Here. I need my sunglasses. That's Karen. Karen is one of our new members. We welcome Karen and everything. She's so lovely. Karen, tell us. It's a, well, I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> Karen, tell us what you do, Karen. I own, oh. Karen Brown. I own, I'm a graduate of FIT. Um, I own that. a fashion PR agency. And uh, we work with retail accounts. We work with lingerie, all different aspects of, of fashion, footwear, handbags, accessories. So I sat here in these very seats. Um, and a lot of what you've heard today is, is true. And I, I, I will just add that on the interview part, um, I think it's really great. As much as you can talk about yourself, your interests, why you think this particular company or job, you know, will be, you'll love it. And you, you share that passion in the, and communicate that in the interview, it's really important because we all get a ton of resumes, the ones that always stick out to me are the ones that have the most experience in terms of internships and other activities, you know, your special interests, art, dance, theater, those are all important too, especially in our field. Um, so the more that you can add breath to who you are on that piece of paper until we actually get a chance to meet you, um, the better for getting in the door. Thank you, Karen. Yes. We'll know it when we see it, oh. which is an interesting opportunity to be wrong. Um, you know, Fashion resumes, meaning strange paper or strange italic or strange font, are not what business people really want to see. We want to see something that talks about who you are. As young people, it's about talking about you and what you want to talk to the company about. The fact that you saw the company online or you stopped in their store or perhaps you, you have an idea. Again, you want to get your foot in the door and not do anything that's egregious, that stands out in the wrong way. Uh, clean, bold, we like white paper generally, tan paper if you want. Um, don't use crazy colored lettering. Even though it sounds fashionable, purple's a great color, but it's not a good color for a letter. In our, it, it may be different, but that's the first means of someone seeing how you can write also of how you can put words in order. So make it clean. I'll just add, resume should be classic to me. If you want to give me your portfolio, it's a portfolio. If you want to give me your resume, it's a resume. Don't try to make the resume the portfolio. So it should be classic, should have the information. It should be easy and, and, and direct to read. And then if you want to be artistic or show me your work, there's another vehicle for that. So, you know, I, I'm not an advocate of confusing these different vehicles of what this is. The, to me, that just creates confusion, um, you know, as far as what you're looking to accomplish. So, to, to, I'm sorry. On the resume? I, I don't, I, I don't, the resume is not that important to me, but I, I think that when you, you know, once you're at, at the level where you're meeting someone, you know, I think it's the first, you know, Andy mentioned, I think it was 90 seconds. I think it's even shorter than that. I think you know within the first few seconds the impression, you know, the thing, in, in my mind, I think you want to get there early, you want to dress like they dress, you want, as soon as you come into the room, you want to, like, have a presence, you want to stand up straight and say, listen, thank you so much for seeing me. And then you, and it's very nerve wracking, you know, to go in and you're meeting, you know, a suit or somebody, you know, it's very, very stressful. So you want to try to get over that nervousness. So you want to be able to project yourself and say, this is, you know, you could talk about the company and say, this is what I can do for you, you know, but it's that first, it's like, you know, I kid around, but it's like dating in a way. It's the first couple seconds, you know, if they're, if they're for you or not, 
you know. There was a question, I think, this young lady up here. I, I don't know if I'm not, I don't know how to answer that question. I think that if, there's, if, if tattoos make a difference or not. Um, Steve, what do you think? I, I don't know if it really means anything to me. No, I mean, again, it comes down to looking professional in my mind. I, you know, if your neck's tattooed and it shows a little bit, I mean, as long as the rest of you looks presentable and put together, um, I, it comes down to who you are as a person. Do you do you take the job seriously? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna dissent a little bit on the idea of what your resume should look like, and that could be because of the industry that I'm in and how important design is uh, to what I'm looking for. But definitely, there's a line between what's professional and what's well designed. Um, so getting a beautifully designed resume by mail. Uh, rather than just an emailed Word document like the 200 or 300 other emailed Word documents I'll get, definitely makes an impression. And in fact, uh, I got my first job in a sort of unorthodox way when you talked about leave behinds um, and visuals. And I don't know if that's just more important to my designers because we like to, to know that they have a good understanding of marketing and, and the importance that those marketing communications make. But they can be hard to ignore. Um, and, and certainly can separate you from, from the crowd. Yeah. There was a, yes, there's a young lady in the top. Well, it's invitation only, only because it's only for people that are already in business, right? And it's people that, you know, that have a different um, there's no overlap with respect to, you know, industry groups. So there's one accounting firm, there's one logistics company, there's one advertise, there's one, you know, placement company. So um, that's kind of how we try to contain it and, um, and, and so forth. So that's kind of how it is. Yes. Right. Well, if you had a company, how do we, yeah, Service Andrew. One of the purposes of the group is to bring something to the group, for example. And, and it's to facilitate knowledge, to facilitate networking, and you have to really be invited into that group. And one of the ways that I was able to, be, to, to join the group was I was invited to a meeting, and then I was invited by some of the members and then you've, they're voted on to be able to join the group. So um, that's how it happened. Yeah, you have to be some, Andy mentioned, you have to be some sort of a service provider to the fashion industry, whether it's money in you know, my case, or it's uh, you know, in, 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 you know, intelligence in Andy's case, or investment banking. In, you know, in Tom's case is you know, um, the, uh, the platform for the, um, the shows and so forth. So. There's somebody, Alice, who are you pointing to as a question? Oh, yes, this, this gentleman right here. Yeah, yeah. I'm a graduate science student, and I was wondering if you could speak about the very first important steps to start your own business. Sure. Uh, like I said, mine wasn't really um, well planned out, so I would start there. <laughs> It'd be great if you had a business plan. Um, mine started, like I said, a little bit more like freelancing, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with. Um, and it just sort of developed into a company. So um, in terms of steps, I mean, I, I think I knew I wanted to have a business at some point in my career. And I think it happened for me a little bit earlier than I had, uh, I had really planned on it happening. Um, but definitely working somewhere else is an important first step to that. I certainly wouldn't be where I am if I hadn't spent some time working for other people, learning about um, how the business operated. Um, you certainly save yourself a lot of time from having to reinvent the wheel when you can see how other people have found success. When I started at the firm that I worked at, I was one of a five-person team. When I left, they were 20. So I watched a small company grow uh, Pretty, pretty quickly, and I learned a lot from, from what, having that experience. You know, 
one of the things Stephen said, and I think we all practice this every day and certainly have practiced it most of our lives, write a business plan. Uh, it may sound a little archaic, but write it in pencil. Write it in something that you can erase and change. And adapt it. Make it a living document as you gain more experience or look at businesses differently or opportunities. Adapt it. But have a plan. You know, and, and that plan is not going to be the final plan. It'll be a plan that changes to accommodate what's going on in the world around you as well as your experience. Now also, I would, I would strongly encourage you to, uh, to consider freelancing as well. Uh, the uh, opportunities abound on the freelance side of the business as companies try to appropriately staff their organizations. And freelance is a wonderful way to interview a company, to find out what the company's culture is, to uh, also find out if it works for you. Uh, and it still appears on your resume. It's, uh, it's work done and performed in the industry that starts to build you as the, you incorporated, you as the, as the, the, the thing or the entity that's trying to move and navigate through the industry. So freelancing is a very, very effective way to, to gain yes. experience. We have, how are we doing on time, Alice? We're doing good. Yes, this young lady. Yeah. Well, v virtually, uh, the vast majority of resumes that we receive, uh, we offer people freelance opportunities if there isn't a full-time opportunity. So a notation to that effect with a cover note to your resume that you're, you're willing to freelance just reinforces the uh, what's going on in the, in the marketplace.